Let us celebrate our patron saint. And we're going to link in the Shropshire connections in the history of England in a quiet and a sober manner that befits all Englishmen. There are many legends <laughs> in many countries about St George, but they all have a common theme. He's a soldier, a chivalrous soldier, with, um, who dies a martyr's death. He must have been an outstanding person to have survived, and his memory to have survived, 1700 years. I suppose it's a shame he wasn't English. <laughs> yeah. Most authorities on the subject seem to agree that he was born in Cappadocia, in what is now Turkey, in the year 280 AD. He enlisted into the cavalry of the Roman army at the age of 17, during the reign of the Emperor Diocletian. And very quickly he established himself a reputation amongst his peers for his virtuous behaviour, physical strength, military bearing, valour and handsome good looks. He quickly achieved the rank of millinery, or tribunus militum, an officer's rank roughly equivalent to a full colonel. He was in charge of a regiment of a thousand men and became a particular favourite of the emperor, who set himself the task of rejuvenating the moral of the citizens of Rome by reviving the prevailing traditions and paganisms of Rome. Against this background, there was an increasing influence of Christianity. As a consequence, Diocletian took strict action against any alternative forms of religion in general and to Christianity in particular. He achieved the reputation of being perhaps the cruelest persecutor of Christians at that time. He issued an edict banning Christianity. Having become a convert to Christianity, St. George acted to limit the excesses of Diocletian's actions. He went to the city of Nicomedia and he tore down the notice of the emperor's edict. St. George gained great respect for his compassion towards Diocletian's victims. As news spread of the rebellion, St. George realized it would not be long before he was arrested. So he gave away his possessions and he freed his slaves. When he appeared before Diocletian, it said that he bravely stood up to him and defended the cruelty and injustice and made a very courageous speech. It made no difference. The emperor consigned him to prison with the instructions that he be tortured until he denied his faith in Christ. Unfortunately, he didn't. And he was beheaded in Nicomedia near Lydia in Palestine on the 23rd of April in the year 303. The legends about St George spread far and wide and it was claimed that near the town of Selene in Libya a dragon dwelt, keeping the population in terror. To satiate him, the population tethered an animal until they had no more. They then provided human sacrifices and in ultimate desperation a young princess was selected the king's daughter named Cleolinda. The story then relates how St George rode up on his white charger, dismounted and fought the monster on foot until it eventually succumbed. The story is a powerful allegory, emblematic of the triumph of good over evil. But it also teaches us the enduring Christian faith in the extreme and the trust that at all times should be placed in the Almighty by the invocation of the name St. George, soldier, saint, and martyr. His remains are said to have been buried in the church that bears his name in Lydia. However, his head was carried to Rome, where it was preserved in the church that is also dedicated to him. St. George was beatified by the Roman Catholic Church and is recognized in the liturgy of the Russian Orthodox and Greek, or Greek Orthodox churches as well as the Catholic Church. His reputation for virtue and chivalrous conduct became the spiritual inspiration of the Crusaders. And by this time, the pennant or flag with a red cross on a white or silver background became prominent as a means of recognition by English knights. It was also worn on their breastplates. In the year 1348, 
King Edward III established the Knights of the Garter, which is the oldest order of chivalry in Europe. <coughs> the Order of the Garter was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, Edward the Confessor, and St. George. The insignia of the order consists of a collar and badge, a pendant known as the George. The star, the garter, and the sash, with the investment of the lesser badge, called the lesser George. This is gold and richly enameled, and represents St. George on horseback slaying the dragon. In 1352, the College of St. George was established in Windsor, with six chorister boys, and since then, St. George's School has played an important role in the daily worship and on state occasions in the Queen's Free Chapel of St. George in Windsor Castle. By pro providing free education and sustenance for the boys, a priceless musical inheritance in core worship has been established. Richard II followed Edward, and in his play, William Shakespeare introduced us to the wonderful description of our land. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in a silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. Yeah. Yes, was, cheers. Go on. <laughs> it was in the year 1415 that St George became the patron saint of England when English soldiers under Henry V won the Battle of Agincourt. The English knights fought on foot after the manner devised by Edward III. Archers were used in support. I have to say, in fairness to our friends across Offers Dyke, that there was some assistance from the Welsh bowmen, although the various acts of union did not follow for another 20 to 30 years. Morale in the English line as they looked upon the overwhelming force of heavily armoured, highly skilled French knights must have been extremely low. King Henry, rising to the occasion, spoke, according to William <coughs> Shakespeare, words of encouragement that rallied the English troops and carried them to a most celebrated victory. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do not work today. Who is he that wishes so? My cousin, Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honour. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather proclaim it, Weston, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours and say <coughs> tomorrow is St. Crispian. And then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed 
shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while Zeddy speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, interestingly, um, now that I introduced the bard, yeah, sorry after that, I don't really want to go. Okay, Shakespeare we've introduced. Uh, he was born on uh, the 23rd of April in 1564. I think actually he was christened on that day, but it was, uh, we say, his birthday. And interestingly enough, he died on the same day, 23rd of April, in 1616. But about this time, uh, the son of Shropshire was heavily involved with the wars against the French. And this son of Shropshire was mentioned in that rousing speech. It was John Talbot, who became a famous commander, who was born at Blakeney in Shropshire. He was the second son of Sir Richard Talbot of Goodrich Castle in Herefordshire. And on the death of his elder brother, Sir Gilbert, he became heir to that family. In 1420, he attended on Henry V to France and was present with him at two sieges, and also on the triumphant entry into Paris. Being retained to serve the king in his French wars with a body of men at arms and archers, he assisted at the siege of Meaux and remained in France till the death of Henry. At the beginning of Henry VI's reign, he was created a Knight of the Garter and was second time made Lord Justice of Ireland. He then served in France under the Regent Duke of Bedford, and by his exploits rendered his name more terrible to the foe than that of any other English leader. He was raised to the rank of general. He commanded the troops which were sent into the province of Maine to succor of the Earl of Suffolk. And he made himself a master of Alisson. He afterwards took Pontois and joined the Earl of Salisbury at the siege of Orléans. This failed, though, through the intervention of the celebrated maid of Orléans, Joan of Arc. After many years of campaigning, the great captain, whose merit was acknowledged equally by friends and foes, he received the appellation of the Achilles of England. His remains were at first buried in France, along with those of his valiant son, but they were subsequently carried to England and were interred at Whitchurch in Shropshire, where a splendid monument is erected to his memory. In 1497, in the reign of Henry VIII, the pennant of the Cross of St George was flown by John Cabot when he sailed to Newfoundland, and it was also flown by Sir Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh. It's now 1564, and we return to Shrewsbury. In that year, a young Philip Sidney uh, started at Shrewsbury School. His father um, was the Lord of the Marches, the President of the Council of the Marches, that's what brought him to Shropshire. He went to Christ Church in Oxford, uh, but never got his degree and started travelling around Europe. When he came home, he became a courtier at the court of uh, Queen Elizabeth I. And he was uh, very popular about court and a favourite of Queen Elizabeth's. Uh, subsequently, he started writing, and he's a well known writer of poetry and verse and an inspiration to others, including Edward Dyer, Grenville, and a young poet called Edmund Spencer. Uh, he continued writing and then married Frances Walsingham. And the Sydneys had one daughter, Elizabeth, who became Countess of Rutland. Uh, whilst his career as a courtier ran smoothly, he wanted more action and tried to join uh, Sir Francis Drake, but uh, Queen Elizabeth found out about it and summoned him back to court. Uh, then a little bit later, she got upset with him and sent him to Flushing to uh, be the governor of the Netherlands. Now here, in a minor skirmish with the Spanish, he was injured. He was shot with a big musket, and uh, it took off his thigh, and it took him 22 days to die, but he did. And that was at a place 
called Zutphen. You may have heard of it. And uh, that is where we get the link with Zutphen from Philip Sidney, who died defending their town. And as he lay mortally wounded, it is said, after the battle, he was lying mortally wounded, and somebody offered him water. And he said, no, I won't take the water. Pass it to my colleague in the next bed. His need is greater than mine. And because of that sort of approach, he was hailed as a hero. And um, the link, as I say, between Shrewsbury and Zutphen was established at that point. Shortly after Sidney's death, Queen Elizabeth I of England addressed the English army at Tilbury Fort. My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that under God I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore, I am come amongst you at this time, not as for my recreation or sport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and for my people, my honor and my blood, even the dust. I know I have but the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart of a king, and of a king of England too. And think foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realms, to which, rather than any dishonor should grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general, judge and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already, by your fullness, that you have deserved rewards and crowns. And we do assure you, on the word of a prince, they shall be duly paid you. In the meanwhile, my lieutenant general shall be in my stead than whom never prince commanded a more noble and worthy subject, not doubting by your obedience to my general, by your concord in the camp, and by your valour in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over the enemies of my God, of my kingdom, and of my people. <laughs> move on to 1620 when the Red Cross of St George was at the flag that was flown by the Mayflower when the Pilgrim Fathers arrived in Plymouth, Massachusetts. <coughs> it's also the flag of the Church of England and as such is known throughout Christendom. Now we take a time jump forward about 200 years uh, to some brave, some say, use another word, but some brave soldierly deeds which were recorded by Alfred Lord Tennyson, the Battle of Balaclava. In 1854, during the Crimean War, the Light Brigade, consisted of, uh, of, consisting of British cavalry regiments, charged down a narrow valley <coughs> with the Russian guns on the side. They were trying to recapture guns they had lost in a previous encounter. The attack should never have been made at all but it was due to miscommunications that uh, the order was misconstrued and so they attacked. The, the obedience and courage of the soldiers, of whom less than a third survived, won great fame for the Light Brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onwards, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade! Charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. 
There is not to reason why. There is but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. Stormed up with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, and not, not the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed back with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, out of the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made! All the world wonders. Honour the charge they made. Honour the Light Brigade. Noble 600. In 1848, six years before Balaclava, Matthew Webb was born in Dorney, Shropshire. He was the first person to swim the English Channel without the use of artificial aids. He was born at Dawn, one of 12 children of a Colbrookdale doctor. He joined the Merchant Navy and served a three-year apprenticeship with Rathbone Brothers of Liverpool. In 1873, Webb was serving as captain of the steamship Emerald when he read an account of the failed attempt by J.B. Johnson to swim the English Channel. He became inspired to try himself and left his job to begin training. First at Lambeth Bath, then in the cold waters of the Thames and the English Channel. And on 24th of August, 1875, he smeared himself in porpoise oil and set off. And despite the stings from jellyfish and strong currents, after 21 hours and 45 minutes, he landed near Calais, the first successful cross-channel swim. His zigzag course across the channel was over 39 miles long. His career, however, was now that of a celebrity swimmer, and his final stunt was to be